The image that is on the front of the bulletin this morning is an image that I am sure many of you have seen before. It is a painting from 1964 entitled The Problem We All Live With, included as a centerfold in the January 11th issue of Look Magazine and painted by the celebrated American artist Norman Rockwell. Rockwell was known for his images that were featured on the cover of another magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, but he had voluntarily terminated his contract with that magazine the previous year because of the limits that were placed on him regarding depictions of political images, specifically relating to the civil rights movement and racial integration, of which Rockwell was an enthusiastic and vocal supporter of both causes. Almost immediately after the work was published, Rockwell began receiving sacks of hate mail from people accusing him of being a race traitor. Rockwell, already well into his 60s, remained nonplussed and continued his relationship with Look Magazine for the next 10 years, painting on a variety of social justice themes that spoke to his own personally held interests and, and convictions. The problem we all live with was inspired by a widely circulated photo from 1960 showing Ruby Bridges being escorted by U.S. Marshals to school as the first African-American student to attend formerly all-white William France Elementary School in New Orleans, which had been ordered to desegregate as a result of a U.S. Circuit Court ruling that same year. Bridges had been born the same year that the U.S. Supreme Court decided in Brown v. Board of Education that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Bridges' parents had recently moved to New Orleans from Mississippi and enrolled their daughter in a segregated kindergarten before being approached by the local NAACP chapter to be one of the first students to integrate William France Elementary. In spite of being subjected to an admissions test administered by the Orleans School Board, also unconstitutional, Bridges and six other Black girls passed the test. Two of the girls ultimately decided to remain at their segregated schools, while three others were transferred to a different formerly all-white elementary school. Bridges was the only Black student to attend William France Elementary. In a 1997 interview she gave later as an adult, Bridges remarked that, as a six-year-old girl, she did not fully understand what was happening around her. Quote, driving up, I could see the crowd, but living in New Orleans, I actually thought it was Mardi Gras. There was a large crowd of people outside the school. They were throwing things and shouting, and that sort of goes on in New Orleans at Mardi Gras. What Rockwell's painting does not show, and what does not get taught to students who learn about Ruby Bridges in school, is the aftermath of what Bridges had to endure after that first day of school. Bridges would be heckled by a mob of angry white people every single morning as she walked to school that year. One white woman in the crowd threatened to poison her every day. Another white woman would hold up an effigy of a black baby doll in a coffin that she had made. Ruby would be under the protection of U.S. Marshals the rest of the year. She was forced to bring her own food from home, as she was not allowed to eat any of the food from the school cafeteria for fear that it had been tainted. She was not allowed to go to recess for fears of the violence that would be directed towards her. She spent the entire first day at William France Elementary in the principal's office with her mother, as it was deemed not safe for her to be in the halls alone due to the chaos that resulted from her integration of the school. Every single white family would eventually pull their children out of the school. Every single white teacher at the school refused to teach Ruby except for one. Barbara Henry, who had moved to New Orleans from Boston two months prior and had taught at integrated military schools while she was with her husband stationed overseas. Henry would meet Ruby as she came to school each morning, and for two years, Ruby would be the only child in her class. Even after white families began re-enrolling their children in the school, 
they would still not allow them to be placed in the same classroom as Ruby, even though the school had been integrated. Ruby essentially still remained segregated. The fallout had an effect not only on Ruby, but the rest of her family as well. Once Ruby's story was published in the media, her, fire was, her father was immediately fired from his job as a gas station attendant. The grocery store where the Bridges family had been shopping refused to serve them anymore. In Mississippi, her grandparents were forcibly removed from the land on which they had been living as sharecroppers. It also had a greater effect on the city of New Orleans as well. Many white families that chose to not return their children to William France Elementary eventually ended up moving to different neighborhoods in the city altogether and establishing private segregation academies for white families who opposed integration to send their children. As of 2023, just last year, the population of white students in New Orleans public schools was only 1.5%. Let me repeat that. In New Orleans, a city whose population is only 50,000 more than that of Stockton, only 1.5% of the student population in New Orleans public schools in 2023 was white. In 1960, when Ruby Bridges first attended William France Elementary, it was 42%. These things were not likely on the mind of L. Griswold Williams as he was writing the words of his affirmation statement. His words were published in 1937, 17 years before Brown v. Board of Education, and long before full racial integration was a societal reality. It is likely that Williams was speaking of the freedom to seek moral, spiritual, and philosophical knowledge unencumbered by any kind of doctrinal limitations or adherence to a particular religious text, reiterating the line about the quest of truth as our sacrament mentioned earlier. But in many ways, the affirmation statement is a living document. It is almost never accepted word for word by most UU congregations. It is almost always revised and rewritten in ways that reflect the particular UU congregation that is adopting its words and speaks to how they understand themselves and their place in the world. But they are also words that are shaped by our modern context and understanding, which is shaped by the reality of our lived experiences. We often forget that access to quality education and the pursuit and attainment of knowledge is not a basic fundamental human right, even though it should be. For those of us who have been privileged to have free access to education, we forget that there are others, often people of color from lower income societies, who have not had the same experiences with regard to education and the pursuit of knowledge that we are. We underestimate what a powerful statement we are making every Sunday when we say the words to seek knowledge in freedom. Every time we utter those words, we are directly invoking our universalist ancestors who spent lifetimes fighting for social justice and who were quick to remind us that we cannot be considered as people who truly have freedom until every single citizen has the same rights to exercise that freedom. What we are saying is that we are called to be the ones who will work to bring freedom about, both in the work that we do in our congregations and in the social justice work that we do outside of the church walls. Or we are called to be the people like Norman Rockwell, who refuse to be limited and will use our platform and our voice to continue talking about and bringing attention to the reality of what is going on, on the, in the world and calling on others like ourselves to bring about the change that we wish to see in the world. As we are coming to the end of our observance of Black History Month for the month of February, 
May we celebrate the bravery of people like Ruby Bridges, who never set out to be a trailblazer, but simply wanted to go to school just like any other six-year-old. And may we also never forget her story and do our part to making sure that other young children just like Ruby do not have to go through the same traumatic ordeals in pursuit of what we say every Sunday, to seek knowledge and freedom. May it ever continue to be so. Blessed be. Amen. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. Namaste. Thank you all so much.